So I'll just put manual a little bit. This is Helka Kasky. Helka and I um, made this work together. It's incredibly important that I make work with people. That's a vital part of the whole thing. And we made this, I now can't remember, Helka, when? Last, summer before last. Um, was it? Summer before last. Uh, and we were commissioned by Glasgow Goma, Glasgow Museum of Art. Have I got that title right? Yes. And they had uh, an exhibition with four, seven Scottish uh, artists, and the theme of it was the everyday. And so we were commissioned, which is, from a dance point of view, is unbelievably exciting. We were commissioned not to respond to the other artists' work, but to deal with the subject matter, which was the everyday. And we did a fair amount of um, odd investigation and came up with, this, uh, with the idea of um, trying to get as many people as possible in, in the situation, in the gallery, to notice movement. Because we have this incredible... You, you, as you came into this room and you sat down you did the most remarkable orchestration of movement and you just don't know it. And there's some way in which I would love you to reacquaint yourselves with that, even briefly, by either looking at Helka or working with Helka. There's another opportunity for that later in the evening. You know, but you, uh, in a way, I want you to congratulate yourselves. You walked. <coughs> One of the brilliant things of being um, a human being is to walk upright and uh, be able to do it while thinking about other things. Um, you entered into a new space and you acquainted yourself with that space on the entrance without even thinking about it. You kind of worked it out. You knew where you were in space. You then sort of did that slightly embarrassed thing about going, oh, it's a space, I must go and sit down. So you kind of orientate yourself towards a place where you want to sit down, not bumping into somebody else. You then um, organise a way of distributing your weight differently so that your pelvis and your spine can take a little bit more weight. You fold in your ankles, knees and hips. You judge the distance between where your bottom is and where the seat is without even thinking about it, without even looking at it. You lower your body while adjusting every single second to where your weight is. So the response loop between where your weight is and where your bottom is and where the chair is, you're going K -k 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 and you land there without a bump. And all the time you might be talking about your busing journey here. In, it's a virtuosic thing. And um, the, the more I've worked with dance, the more, in a way, the, the pleasure, the excitement of trying to notice this, but obviously to some extent put it in a context which uh, allows it to be um, perceivable to you, allows you to enjoy it in a particular way rather than in an only academic way. So Manuel came up uh, as that solution for that problem and works so superbly with Jose's um, work here, even down to all the footprints that he seems to leave in all the jars uh, and vitrines up the stairs. So I'm, I'm delighted to bring this work here and to share it in front of so many people. So that's, that's incredible. So it's this idea of noticing movement. And one of the reasons I couldn't help but uh, reach out towards Jonathan is we were both involved in a dance and neuroscience series of discussions in which from a, a, a medical neuroscience point of view uh, and from an arts point of view, we were trying to see what the cross points were. Because if I'm fascinated by um, this expression uh, that the body has, uh, what does Jonathan tell me? What are we doing all the time? We are locomoting, locomating, locomoting? Can I use that word? We are locomoting, we are going somewhere. <coughs> We are, what are the other two ones? I always forget. Well, in very simple terms, you can have, action can be locomotor, so you're walking or mm. doing something to get from one place to the other. Instrumental action is dressing or reading or picking your nose or whatever. Mm. And then there's expressive action, 
which locomotion and instrumental action can be expressive, but there are some actions which are purely expressive, whether that's gesture while mm. we're talking or what Sue has spent her career doing. Mm. So early days of movement were to some extent about over-elaborating the movement possibility of the body, over overdoing it in a way, from my perspective now, not from other people's perspective, but from my perspective it was about over-demonstrating the capacity, the technical capacity of the body and not playing with these everyday things which are remarkable to each and every one of us. The, the simplicity of locating myself from here to there, the ability to um, have within the archive of my body all of these experiences that have helped teach me how to get from A to B, how I could use, I could dip into that archive, I don't think I do, but I, mean, I must do, but I'm certainly not conscious of it, the first explorations of learning were to move, to, to be able to move as a, as a baby and to explore the world and to understand that if I reached out with my arms, something else would happen, you know, something would happen to my spine. If I reached out with my arms, I might be able to reach something. The feedback loop between all of these, it could be a gesture of desire, but it was also a locomotion because it was going to get me somewhere and it might build up my muscles in a different way. Um, and it's also practical in the sense that it is part of human desire to reach the next goal. Now, as a dance artist, I can use all of those things as first base without necessarily reaching into the what I call um, uh, enormous vocabulary of dance extended movement. But for me, if I pull back, I start to come into this idea of human behavior. And then that to me is the most extraordinary use of expression that I, you know, I can, I mean, I can't tell you how excited I get. This is what I'm like all the time. You know, I get really, really excited when I get. So, so I get excited too. <laughs> <laughs> Just about so noticing movement. Yes, uh, we learn to move, and there are various theories in neuroscience about uh, when we make a reach to something or when we are playing tennis, how we learn to get better. And mm. you can do complicated Bayesian type uh, mathematics to how the brain learns to improve movement by reducing the degrees of freedom, by reducing mm. the variability once it's decided what to do. But also, equally, there's some evidence that when we're learning, say, um, this is the sort of thing a neurophysiologist will do. He'll put someone in a, in a sledge, firm like that, and the sledge is then in a room that's, and he's spun round rapidly, so rapidly, that when you make a reach out to collect something, there's a, there's a force, because you're going round and round and round in a centrifuge, basically. And when you go to make a reach, there's a force across you. How do you learn to overcome that force? Well, mm. you do that quite rapidly. And that's not the experiment. The experiment at the end of it is to ask, well, have you adapted the other arm to make that movement mm. as well? And when you do that, it seems that the people who adapt one arm by not moving in the force, but from learning from the other arm when it is in the force, are those who make errors. So it's as though the brain, in order to learn, it's choosing different ways of doing it and seeing what happens. And those who only make one movement tend not to adapt the other arm as well. That's how exciting. About that? How about... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, if we talk about being aware of movement, hmm. uh, one of my... If, if you were to read... One of the first books in neuroscience, I think it's 1833, by a man called Charles Bell, who was Scottish and worked at the Middlesex Hospital, amongst other things... And he describes something called movement or position sense or proprioception. So you're sitting without having to think how you sit. You stand without having to think how you stand. Because you have muscle and joint and skin receptors that tell the brain where your leg is. Mm. And if you didn't have those, would you be able to move? Well, Charles Bell said, how, you know, how do we move? We're not aware of how we move normally, but if we're on a ladder or we're across a narrow bridge, suddenly we become aware of it because we have to become and we get a bit wobbly. How does a blind man stand? He has to be aware internally of where he is. 
And that's mm. proprioception, that's movement and position sense. And he did a whole series of conclusions on the basis of his own thinking about what must be the case, nearly all of which happened to be true. Um, and then, um, then one of the, the reasons Sue and I got together was a, a man who um, is called Ian Waterman. And he, at the age of 19, was a butcher on Jersey when he had a diarrheal infection. And his, the white cells in his body raised an antibody to the, the virus, which then happened to do an extraordinary thing. It wiped out all his nerve cells to do with touch and proprioception. So he's now 62 and he lives without any knowledge of where his arms or legs or body is in space and no awareness of touch below the neck. Can you, again, can you imagine, this, is, is, this was a really informative thing for me. To, it, it was like a brick bat because when he wakes up in the morning, he doesn't know where he is. He has to look where his arms and his legs are. He does not know where he is in the world. And the brickbat was, we are so fortunate to know that simple everyday thing is we know where we are in the world. So that it made me go way back to understand how can I work with that as an artist, that we should actually contemplate that we, we do, all of us, we all know where we are in the world. And all of us have an archive of movement that we are incredibly knowledgeable about, but we don't necessarily notice. And yeah, we'll stop. <laughs> Keep going, All right. Ian. Well, one of the things we do is we build up skills, don't we? As a child, we learn. We learn to stand. We learn to reach for something. We learn. I can remember learning to tie my shoelaces. We and then we don't have to think about it after that because it becomes automated in our brains, in various parts of the brain. Um, Ian has to think about everything that he does. He has to look at what he's doing and think about it. And if he doesn't think about it, he can't do it. So if he has a head cold, he goes to bed because he hasn't got enough brain power to move. The other thing is he doesn't know one day if something he did yesterday he can then do today or the next day because he doesn't have skills. He has to think every time, every movement. And of course, when he does more movements, he has to think more. So it becomes more and more of a mental effort to move. So if you say, Ian, do you want a cup of coffee? Or if you want a cup of coffee, what do you do? And the first thing he says is, I've got to want the cup of coffee enough <laughs> to stand, to move across, to do, and to do everything, and then sit down. And you know, a friend once said, Ian, do you ever sit down with a gin and tonic at the end of the day? And he said, well, no, because sitting down is a task. So that's not a way out. And actually mm. grasping a glass is, it, is really yeah. difficult. Yeah. Because he doesn't know how much force to put on the glass. He can't feel it. Mm. He doesn't know how heavy it is. Mm. So the only way he can relax is on a bed where he can just flop. With a gin and tonic. With a gin and tonic. I think he does do that. In a mm. good sized glass but he can't get drunk either because if you get drunk you can't think mm. and he does, but I think I mean, he, he's a bit like an athlete by thinking he has to be at the top of his game in order to move if he's just a little bit drunk, just a little bit tired I mean I can tell if he's tired way before he can because he's not moving the same way because mm. he's not thinking the same way so Another aspect that goes towards this is this idea of the, the body as archive, that the, all of these everyday things that have happened to you, all of these experiences which are common to all of us, these physical, these, these, the, the feedback loop between the thought, the feeling, the experience. Really, you are a library of knowledge but how consciously do we dip into that library? And we'll do it, I feel, more readily with words, and we apply ourselves to the, to the thought and to the shaping of the word. Um, although uh, Jonathan said something while we were having a cup of tea, is that actually most of the time we don't shape our words, do we? We were, well, uh, we were talking about thoughts, mm. and um, 
and actions, if you like. We normally think about goals. We want to pick up a. We want to. We want water, so we pick up. We don't think we've got to go forward and do this, that, and the other. We're all. We just have a goal, and our body does what we need. Um, so we don't think about actions. Do we think about our thoughts? Well, we often do think about our thoughts, but often our thoughts come unbidden to us. Mm. And there's some work suggesting the majority of thoughts that come to us, we don't actually ask for in a way. They just appear. Um, so Where do they appear thoughts, from? Well, we, uh, consciousness, yeah, who knows what consciousness is, but it's a bit like a... So you, you can't have a decent analogy for consciousness. Mm. Um, it used to be a telephone exchange. It might be a computer. It might have... But if you think of it, there's a light inside your head that's shining, and it shines, and what you what the, you see is what you're conscious of. But that's a fraction of what's going on in the brain. When um, there's a lot of work, say you're listening, you're you're attending to something over here, but someone is playing words over there, and you're not really you're not being told to listen to them, and you're not listening to them. If you look at the, what the brain is doing, it's doing huge amounts of analysis non-consciously on the speech mm -hmm. to make it sensible so that if you were attending to it you'd have heard it and you'd mm -hmm. have parsed it properly you didn't ask to do that your brain just does it but you're only conscious of something I mean, it's sometimes neuroscientists talk about attention mm -hmm. rather than consciousness I mean, they're not the same thing but they're happier to talk about attention because you attend to things I mean there's that wonderful um, playing basketball you, you know about visual inattention there's a very famous you may have seen it on YouTube if you haven't you should go and have a look there are three basketball players in black and three in white and the task and they're in front of a lift and all you have to do is count the number of times the basketball is passed between each side that's all you have to do and at the end of it they, they say how many times and it lasts I don't know about 20 seconds and everyone says, well, it's six or seven or eight times. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, did you see the man in the gorilla suit who walked across? <laughs> with, you know, and most people didn't see him. Did not see mm -hmm. a gorilla suit man walk. Because you're attending to something else. So visual attention is very selective. And the whole nature of attention is selective. So when we're trying to remember a physical experience... And that's what interests me in terms of, of the archive of physical experience that we have and how do we draw upon it and do we want to draw upon it? I mean, I'm quite curious about it as a, as a resource. But trying to remember a physical experience, where, do we rem where, do we, where does that reside? Well, that's fascinating be because we, we're very visually dominated mm. and we're very <coughs> cognitive and intellectual and linguistic. And one of the, not problems, but one of the fascinations of looking at the physicality of movement is how you express it, mm. how you cognitively approach it. Uh, it's there. You know, there's a, I was thinking of Tolstoy in Resurrection. He, the, the one guy recognises someone he hasn't seen for 20 or 30 years, uh, from a young man to an old man, but he recognises him by his gait, not by mm. the, what he looks mm. like, but how he moves. And those sort of things are really deeply embedded in us, but how, you know, how do you describe them? How do you experience them? Uh, those are not easy no. questions. Well, the more short-sighted I get, the more I judge people by their gait, because I can't <laughs> recognise them from across the room, or how they, or how they tip their head. I, I learn yeah. a lot, because I can't, yeah. can't recognise their faces anymore. So these motor programs, the way we move, become individual to us. And we might be able to see them, we can record them, we can video them. But how do we explain to someone else how someone else moves? It's really difficult. How do we ask someone to stand up? Mm. Because we don't know how we stand up. Um, but we do. But we just don't, know, we just don't think about it. No, we don't think about it. Yeah, We yeah. do it. Yeah. I mean, it is slightly constrained because we normally do a series of movements without not one movement stop, then another mm. movement stop, then another movement stop. So, it, But it is the case that it's really difficult to explain how to do something. And it's really difficult to explain how we do something mm. Mm. or how different someone's gait is to someone else. Um, 
And language is just a way, we, we need to share experience to share language, probably. But the, it's this linguistic, um, uh, it's this, the, how the linguistic has dominated uh, as a form of our expression, whereas to some extent there feels as if there is a, uh, a physical, um, intuitive, but deep-seated knowledge that we're not using as much as we could. Yes, I mean, there's, there's some work suggesting that language itself evolved through action. Yes. Mm. So it's constrained by the actions we make. Mm. Um, so we understand sit by sitting, mm. we understand you know, using that again and again, pick up by picking up. Mm. And not only do we use those words, but it constrains the way we construct sentences and it constrains the way we see the world. Mm. But of course then language becomes much more complex than that. Uh, and you have to ask why we evolved language in the first place. Susan, <laughs> in a way. Su Su and, and another person I speak to a lot is Susan Hitch, and she said there was no necessity to call this in, in, in when I was a primal man, which I remember vividly. There was, no, there was no reason to call that cup because it was there, so you didn't necessarily have to name it. The thing that you had to name was the thing you couldn't see, which was the thing over the hill, which was food or water or whatever else. So you started to have to name what you couldn't see. Oh, he's yeah. sucking his teeth, so he's not, no, I'm not sure. That that's that's a, <laughs> a, whether or not it's true, there's a lovely man, Robin Dunbar, who came up with the theory of language. Mm. Uh, he plots the size of a non-human non primate social group against the length of time that social group grooms each other. Because picking ticks off is not about picking ticks off, it's about social relationships. And as primates got more successful, their social group got bigger. So in order to maintain social cohesion in that group, they had to spend longer grooming each other. And eventually, they had to find a way to groom each other without picking the ticks off because there wasn't long enough in the day <laughs> to feed, sleep and pick the ticks off. So what was it? It was language. Language evolved so that we could have a larger social group. Mm. So language is social grooming. So mm. language's purpose is to gossip because gossip glues us together. That's his theory. Oh, I like that one. Because yeah. like <laughs> language, it's yeah. not that great. Language, you have to be so eloquent to be mm. emotionally really sharp. That's why we worship people who can write eloquently. Mm. But language, for most of us, it becomes inadequate at the heightened points of emotional mm. experience. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we might have gesture, we might have hug, we might have facial expression, we might have lots of things, but it's really difficult to say how you feel. Unbelievably difficult. Yeah. So that slightly circles us back to, to Manuel because one of the things that was very exciting about Manuel was that people would, two people would talk together about something that they both knew well and that they shared. So initially we thought we were in a way doing a movement piece about the everyday. And by the time we had um, practiced with, well, if, probably more than, well, 50 in the rehearsal period, we realised that it was a form of conversation, a really shared conversation about communicating to each other about something that we know about and we do every day. And the build-up of that conversation and where it led you to was one of the excitements of doing, doing the work. So I'm going to, can you, I don't know if you can, uh, do you want to say any of them, but people might not be able to hear you and yes, you stand up or... Uh, say any of, oh, any of the experiences that you had while doing manual, which led from, I can remember the people yeah. walking around the room. So we also, uh, how can hear so <laughs> you guys too. Um, coming up to standing and from seating to standing and the walk, which I think you guys were doing mm. as Catherine was helping me to stand up. Um, and especially the walk, someone teaching me how to walk seemed to enable a conversation after, what, after I had learned <laughs> how to transform my weight, how to place the foot in front of the other one. Um, 
and there was especially uh, one one man who was quite quite young, I think, and he really he was interested in watching what I had done with someone else before. And I approached him, and he said, "No, no, no, I don't want to. No, no, it's, it's I don't feel comfortable with this." Um, but we had a little chat, and he agreed. Oh, I'll, I will do this now. And he had amazing notions during this uh, walk. He um, he said about him coming a performer, uh, the philosophy of actually two people just meeting, uh, mm. learning together, being closer than we are. We were really almost touching. Um, our arms were touching each other. And and having a slower pace than other people around us, which, which brought us into kind of into another, into another, um, not reality obviously, but into another space within the gallery space. Mm -hmm. um, another great experience was in Margate quite recently, where, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the um, Toyota Contemporary, mm -hmm. Um, a friend of yours, I believe, who who is um, how do you call this support when you with walk? a walker? Yes. Yeah, with a walker. Mm. <laughs> um, an older lady, um, obviously needs assistance and needs an object to help them to sit down or to stand up. And she had, she gave me instructions how to stand up from sitting, and she did it with me. But of course, she ha she has to do it in such a different way to me. So. That was quite interesting mm. to draw attention to the to the di different bodies which we all have as well. Mm. The adjustment. The yeah. adjustment. Mm. The 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 height. Mm. How much you need to really? How much you need to be able to push at the same time, and how far you can bend forward. Mm. Mm. I can bend quite a lot further than this this woman could. So, and then what's easy for her became really difficult for me. So. Mm. We had an interesting time. Yeah. After which she wrote me around in this. <laughs> <laughs> I could sit on her stool and she would take we, the um, on the wheels. Yeah. On Helgrits Matthias, with whom we did it, with Ian Waterman did it. Oh, I, I right. would say Ian... Yeah. Uh, who has no proprioception. Without proprioception or touch. He spent, he spent 17 months as an inpatient in a hospital in Britain, in Salisbury, learning how to put his socks on, learning how mm -hmm. to dress learning how to feed himself, learning how to stand, and then learning how to walk. And then he went off and lived independently. Uh, but he would spend every minute of his waking life learning how to move. And in order to make the fingers move, he would get paperclip chains, and he would spend six weeks doing them. The first time he used a stamp, he had to lick it in those days, and he was all right getting it up there, but then he couldn't feel where the stamp was in his mouth. So from then on... He always licked the envelope and then stuck the stamp on the envelope. <laughs> so there are always different ways round. Uh, so when Ian did manual, um, Sue was there. He was pretty good because he knew what to do. But he's worked out the physics of the body. That's something we haven't really talked about. Um, you know, standing up. He says the only way to stand up properly is to have the chin over the feet. Because if it's too far forward, you'll stand up and go forward. If it's too far back, you'll stand up and mm. go backwards. He talks about, he, we did some filming of him picking up a Swede in a greengrocer's. He said the first thing he does to pick up a Swede is to brace, get his legs in the right place and then brace his back. Because when you pick up a Swede and it's out there, you'll fall over because it will tip <coughs> you over because the physics of movement are such that you'll do that. So he was very aware, not just how you stand, but the physics of the body that underpin that, because he's had to work it out. Um, we, did, we did one experiment where we said, Ian, because he's so amazingly clever at working out whatever we ask him to do, that when we ask him to do something, we have to tell him nothing at all. Otherwise, he'll work, away, work out how to do it before he's done it, because he visualizes everything. Yeah. And we said, stick your hand under that towel and move, grip the gripper and then you can move your hand like that. <coughs> and then go, divide that up into nine, and see if you can go from one to two, to five, to seven, to eight, whatever. There was a reason we were doing it, honestly. Uh, 
And then we anticipated that he would be, he would go from one to two to three <coughs> using a certain force, if you like, and so that any time he got, ac if he was inaccurate with one, he would produce the same force in the next one. So he'd be just as inaccurate in the next one. So he'd accentuate all the errors. But actually at the, the far end of each side, and in the middle, he was more accurate. He could get to those even though we never gave him any feedback about what he was doing. So he, he couldn't feel it and he didn't know where it was, but he could do it. And right at the end, I, I asked him, how on earth do you get to the midpoint when you can't see it or feel it? And he does, he can feel tension in the muscle. And I presumed that was, he made it absolutely rigid and he knew that when it was rigid, it was in the midpoint rather than there or there. And he looked at me, as he often does, as I was an idiot. And he said, well, it's obvious, isn't it? Because when I'm not making any movement one way or the other, when the wrist is completely relaxed, when there's no muscle activity in my arm, my, arm, my wrist has to be in the midpoint. Because he'd learnt the physics of how the wrist moves. If there's no muscle activity, it's in the midpoint. So you can see why I get excited by all of this, and that, that this is the... Um this is the, the area that I want to explore more and more. So, the, so work, that's, that's the direction of, that the works are sort of going in, but in very, very different ways. I, I made a, a film a couple of years ago, which in a way is a story, it's a narrative, and I'm, not, I'm going to talk about it very briefly, but it's again, um, one of the reasons for doing it was um, I had, uh, I wanted... I've got to explain this properly because it's quite complicated. I looked at Jules Etienne Marais, who is the, um, uh, the contemporary of Mybridge, a French scientist, actually less of an artist, a scientist, who was the first person to photograph movement. So he was photographing. It wasn't film. It wasn't strung together at that moment. It was only photography. So he was trying to see all of the things that we're talking about, like where the shift of the body is, you know, where's the... F there were lots of walking to, uh, in, amongst them. And I got fascinated by these stills, and that within that still, there was all this incredible information in the still, although he was a scientist and he was looking at movement. So I wondered whether one could make a film, I made a film with David Hinton, in which these captured stills... In, with all sorts of different subject matter, would, if they were strung together, so you might have a still from 1860 and you might have a black and white and you might have a tiny bit of movement in colour with a tiny bit of action and then another black and white from a different era and then another something. And if you strung them together, each of these moments would add up to helping tell a story, helping to tell a state of mind, helping to reveal... Um, a part of human behaviour within a, a particular story. So it's another way of having, you know, getting the pleasure of seeing the everyday, they were all documentary films and photographs that we were looking at, that getting to look at the everyday in its particular, in its isolated moments, and whether or not we can use those by collectively putting them together, by making a compositional form out of them, by isolating them and then collecting them together, what can we do? What kind of stories can we tell? So I, we could talk for ages, but I'm just wondering, here you are sitting in islands, on, on beautiful islands, and whether or not you'd like to raise a question or, or uh, of the three of us, or anything. Um, when did your collaboration start? I'm, I'm very interested. It's very organic, um, the way you're talking about scenarios. is uh, is very rooted in the same centre as it were. Um, I'm just interested because we come from quite differing backgrounds mm. apparently to start with. <coughs> where, where this started, uh, did you see each other talk or, or did you have a common meeting to discuss like, these issues? I mean, I, I'm fascinated by movement and use science <coughs> to try and understand it but also narrative. So I write books about what's it like to be this guy who's in a wheelchair or whatever and I was invited to a Gulbenkian foundation workshop on something or other uh, <laughs> and I have to say Sue spoke and I thought she spoke really well, I normally wouldn't do it and I had no idea who she was because I have no idea about choreography and dance and so I went up and introduced myself to her 
That was it. (laughs) Something I wouldn't normally do, but very glad I did. And we're trying to keep... um, Well, we we keep feeding off each other, and we keep talking and emailing, and um, Jonathan, as you can tell, knows so many things that I get advice on what to read and um, all sorts of things like that, which is lovely. But we are trying to think about... We've been trying to work out whether or not we could approach this idea of what feeling is. And um, and one of the stories that I'm going to tell, because I love this story, but Jonathan told me, was I was trying to find du- like duets in which one is, one is learning one through another. And um, Jonathan's wife, Sue, is a horse rider. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think she took Jonathan to see... Um, uh, uh, a very very famous rider on a you know those like a Spanish it's not a Spanish it's Portuguese it's Portuguese not Spanish dressage. but it's it's a Portuguese dressage but it's like the Lipizzana and so this horse is they come into the um, uh, paddock or indoor paddock and this horse is being ridden by an excellent rider and you know by an English English rider. dressage international rider okay so smart stuff and and both of them keep out of it both of them look pretty good I'm going to tell the story wrong I told so he's going to correct me I just love this bit of the story and anyhow another rider gets up on this horse and the master is older and is standing by the horse and tells the rider the horse must not move so we've seen this horse move and it looks gorgeous and it's done all its thing and the master says do not let the horse move and the rider does nothing and the horse fidgets for a bit, and then the horse calms down, and there is nothing that you can see that the rider is doing. And the man says, do not let the horse move, and the horse begins to do this thing where it collects its legs further underneath its torso. And, and Jonathan's, you know, I, I can just see it, Jonathan's going, my God, what's happening? And this horse is doing this, and the master says again, do not let the horse move. And the whole horse takes on a completely other shape. Somehow to me, and I'm, I'm now elaborating the story like mad, um, <laughs> somehow to me a sort of more primal animal, and then eventually the horse says, the horse may lift one leg, and apparently it does. And there's no movement in the rider. So my God, what's happening in terms of that communication? And eventually the horse is allowed to move what's what is going on there in terms of human human and animal communication makes me shiver to think about it now and that's the 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 northern the dressage you see in the olympics is northern european or european Mm -hmm. dressage where it i think it arose it's all military but the aim is to go forward in certain Mm -hmm. moves and go from one movement to the other smoothly in Portuguese dressage, which came from sword fighting, which is much closer to hand, rapid movements over a much shorter area, you get collected underneath far more, so you get more elevation of the horse, and the head is right underneath Mm. as opposed to extended out. If you look at most statues of most kings of Europe, they'd be on a Portuguese horse, which is collected. With that round neck thing. You recognise it. It's a short-bodied horse. and what the rider did was just by posture, by sitting in the... They don't use a, her hands very mm, much, they just use mm. posture. It had stopped the horse going forward and made it collect. And as it collected, instead of going through what it had learned, it started snorting <laughs> and it became a beast. Mm. And eventually, and the, the rider wouldn't let it go forward. And eventually, the rider just said, OK, you can just go forward a bit. And it, it, but it, the way it moved was completely controlled by... Purely mm. the weight of the rider on the horse and recognised it had to do something else. Well, we thought um, Helka might find somebody to do another do another yeah. manual, yeah. and um, find a place to enjoy it or go out into the cold. <laughs> <laughs> because you, now you know what's going on yes. in a way. The way you probably mm. you thought what. Yeah. What, was, what are what, they doing? But, you know, we don't know how we move, usually. Um, and coming back to my hero, my other hero, Charles Bell, uh, he said, 
a man's mind is fascinated by a mechanism of a watch or something, mm. but never gives attention towards something exquisite and far more complicated, which is just how he moves. He said, you know, if you're ill and you try and move your hand and you've got, you know, you, your hip hurts, any movement in your hip will hurt because any movement that you make is going it's to married, be yes. affecting mm. all movements in your body probably. And you realise that when you're ill. You realise that if you fall over, if you make any small movement because you haven't got proprioception. Mm. And then you look at trying to tell someone how to do something as simple as stand up. Could and I who's going to be brave enough? Why do we enjoy that? Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's a brilliant, it's a yeah, great question, great. and it's great a, question. it is another... Uh, you feel elated when you yeah? do Scottish dancing. Yeah. You feel exhausted if you do Scottish dancing. <laughs> um, yeah. But you feel uh, good. You do feel good, and that is, uh, I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to edit that out at all. I suppose I've just, having, having for a while, having for a long time, trying to work out a language, a movement language, when I first started, I learnt techniques. I learnt the Graham technique, or I learnt the Cunningham technique, and I learnt these techniques. And I thought, if the more I learnt, the more I would have a language that would help me find the expression in the body, which would help me, um, yeah, be a performer. So this is, wasn't so much about dancing in a, in a disco, in which one can lose oneself utterly and completely. But that's not performative. That's not necessarily communicating to anybody else apart from the sexy beast opposite you, ideally. But, you know, they, but that's, that's that kind of interaction. But what happens when you are in a more performative situation? Where is that expression? And I, and I think I drowned myself in trying to find this rich, richer and richer and richer language to find this expression. And I felt that I was editing and editing and editing myself out. But that was, you know, that was my journey, not... I think it's a great question. Uh, I've got lots of different answers. It, it, I'm a runner, and oh, I enjoy yeah. just running, and I enjoy the act mm. of running. Which, And there are receptors in the body that go back that give you some aspects of fatigue or pleasure. Come back to what Charles Burley said. It's a feeling almost voluptuous after physical exercise, and we all know that. Uh, but also, when we run or when we make any movement that we train, a lot of what we do, it's again, we're not thinking about it because we have these programs that just run. And mm. if the program runs and the feedback we get back exactly matches those two, I think that may of itself, that harmony between intention mm. and action may be pleasurable of itself. And it, I, I've also written something that just unfolding the programs that you make may be pleasurable. Within the brain, you may not need to do anything else than just have these motor programs, these images of movement in your head, and that may be pleasurable. And that, lastly, I come on to Stereo Sue, who is Sue Barry is a professor of biology in America, and she had two wonky eyes as a child. So one was over there, one was over there, but she could see through both. And so what the doctors did was made her look normal. So they operated so the eyes were straight ahead. So she looked all right. But she could never use two eyes together. To s and without that, you don't get stereo vision. Mm. So she had, she had eyes, but she couldn't use them together. She didn't have depth perception. And then she taught herself using a string with a series of beads to, that would, say, be between there and here. And she'd, get, she'd try really hard and get the eyes converging so that she got stereo vision. And she did it in her 40s. She only got stereo vision until her 40s. And she got high on stereo vision. <laughs> and she would go out and she'd look at trees because the depth, she just found it voluptuous to see the depth in vision. And snow, she went out in a snowstorm just to look at the snowflakes and the 3D she was just lost in that space. And, you, and I asked her, because when I have new glasses, now I'm old, I get high. I noticed independently of even knowing about her at the time, suddenly when I looked at a table, I could see 3D better. And it was really lovely to see. Mm. You know, I'm not entirely mad. Lots of people think this. So I asked her, but my mind fades. 
My, you know, my feeling high over 3D vision fades, but hers never does. Because I asked her, do you ever get tired mm. of it? She says, no. And I think the reason she doesn't is she has to try very hard and train her eye muscles to get stereo vision every day. <coughs> she has to train. So the la one of the last reasons you get pleasure from action is when it's... Pleasure is how the brain gives mm. you reward for the effort of movement, when that movement is mm. harmonious in some way. Mm. So I think she continues to get the pleasure of action because there's effort in action. And there might be something here about balancing all the senses together. And if by, by however we live, we somehow edit out, we edit out some, of, some sensual feedback, you know, whether or not we don't look when we're walking very fast in the street, or we choose not to hear, or we choose not to notice colour, which we do, we do a lot. Um, and there are all sorts of lovely exercises, like going um, walking. I walk from Camden Town to the Aldwych every day, and I choose a colour every day. And if, so I say, oh, it's purple. And I think, oh, there'll be nothing purple on the street. And you suddenly see everything is purple. You just go from one purple thing to the other. So it's about trying to find, refine the things which are there. Um, I do it with girls. You do it with girls. Yeah, yeah but they're always More there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, we should, um, should we go to a manual? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I kind of want to know if there maybe is someone who would really like to do one manual with me? Oh, there's some there. Oh, someone is there. Okay, great. So I hope you can hear. If you can't hear, come a bit closer if you want to hear. Um, okay. Quickly here so you don't get too much help from <laughs> how I get down. Um, I would like you to just tell me how to begin. What should I do first? Um, chill down. Okay. I am quite chilled down. No, and chin down. I'm sorry. Sorry? Your, your chin. Ah, my chin down. down. So down towards the floor towards, or? Towards uh, your chest. Your, uh, lift your right hand and. <laughs> and your arm. My right arm? Your right arm. Okay. Uh, and put it on your, on, your, on your tummy. On my tummy? Yeah. Now you uh, unfold it and you lift uh, your shoulder and your upper body. I lift my shoulder and my upper body. No, no, I should have listened more. Like your head. Yes. <laughs> 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 so, oh, so, oh, yes. yes, so your elbow doesn't touch. Yes. You, Yes. Okay. So now you unfold. No, no. Yes. Um, now you fold your left uh, knee. Uh, with and you yes, you fold. Should I? Do and you do knee up or knee up and uh, your uh, left foot flat on the floor. And now you push somewhere until no, stop. stop okay. Now you push. Uh, get your bottom up. Can I do it? Yeah. Ah. Yes, you can try it. Okay. Yeah, you can. So I just I, I, I you don't take the visual information, but you can. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So mm. Wow. Okay, so you lift uh you lift you take uh, your bottom up mm. pushing uh, uh maybe this knee is not fine. Can you fold it a bit more? The left uh, knee. The left knee. Mm. And yeah. at the same time you lift your oh, sorry. bottom. Mm -hmm. Stop, stop. Okay. Flat on the floor. So maybe I can watch. So you push <laughs> on your finger at the same time you your head up your and you um on, uh, yeah, uh, so you push on your finger you lift your head and you 
so ah, I'm already starting. doing it. I, I'm going to go down yeah. a bit to relax. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <Quite. back. laughs> I'll go back there. Okay, so... Yeah, because I have to give the movement as well of your of your chest, no? Here, or your back, or, or so... Yes. Yeah, so Are you unfold? Ah, yeah. So you push your your on your on your uh, finger. You unfold your knees, head up, lift your bottom, uh, separate your chest from your knee, head up, uh, lift <laughs> uh, lift your chest towards uh, the top. Uh, more, more. More. Uh, you uh, now uh, you balance your pelvis to. Uh, I don't know if even how to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alright here movement. now. So the pelvis you would like me to balance to which way? To uh, front. So you get so yes. You bring so at the same time, yeah. <laughs> so I fold your knee as well. Your knees. Unfold and fold knee. your knees. Yeah. Your sh uh, shoulders. Uh, uh, unroll your shoulders towards the back. Mm. Yeah, head up. Head up. Oh, uh, chin up. Yeah. Uh, I'd just like to thank Eleanor very much and Archangel very, very much for allowing us to come and um, uh, share the things that are exciting us enormously in Helka. Thank you. Um, Thank <laughs> you.